Well, good morning. Um, great to see all of you here at the, the U.S. Mom. This is my uh, second Mom of the Year, actually. We were in um, Vienna and Austria a few weeks ago with uh, Microtik, and that was very cool. And so it's, uh, it's great to be back at uh, another uh, Mom. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Myers. I'm a network architect with uh, IP Architects. Been working on Microtik for about, uh, I guess, about seven years now, uh, something like that. And um, today we're going to talk a little bit about using full table route reflectors uh, to help improve the performance on your BGP border routers. Um, we're going to be talking about the performance, scalability, things that you can do with it, why it's important, and, uh, and things like that. So I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I spent about uh, 20 years in networking and network engineering, um, started in the late 90s. Um, worked on uh, about six different continents, building and designing networks, uh, enterprise, data center, um, ISPs, a little bit of everything. Uh, Microtech certified trainer, uh, also uh, Microtech Cisco and uh, Microsoft certified. One of the things that I always talk about whenever I give a presentation is the community involvement because I'm very, very passionate about being involved in the network engineering community and giving back to the network engineering community. So uh, some of the things that I'm very involved with are uh, the packet pushers. If you haven't heard of them uh, or haven't listened to them, I highly recommend that you uh, uh, subscribe to the Packet Pushers podcast. Um, Ethan and Greg and Drew are great, a uh, great bunch of guys. They cover a lot of different things in network engineering. They're fantastic. If you're on Facebook and you're in either the uh, Router OS, Microtik unofficial group, or the uh, Wisp Talk group, uh, you'll find me hanging out in those places a lot um, and talking about a bunch of different things, usually Microtik, a lot of it. Um, I go to uh, Networking Field Day. Uh, usually several times a year, which is a group that goes to Silicon Valley and looks at emerging technologies and network engineering, and you visit uh, different companies to see what's, what's new and what's coming out. Uh, so there's a lot of videos about that if you're interested. Uh, Microtech Forum, you'll find me as IPA Net Engineer on there. I've been on there for about six or seven years, uh, commenting on different things. So if you've got a question, feel free to hit me up in that channel. And Network Collective, which is, uh, I guess, almost two years old now, which is a uh, podcast that also has a Slack channel that you can subscribe to that is hyper-focused on network engineering. Um, a lot of it's in the enterprise space, but they're starting to get into the service provider space as well. I've been a guest on their podcast a couple times, and it's really just a great group of uh, people if you're into networking. So definitely check all those out. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on my company. Um, IP Architects uh, is the largest microtech consulting firm globally. We've got engineers in six different time zones now. Um, we've got locations in uh, South America, North America, and I think it's my next slide is most recently Europe. Uh, we've got a pre presence over in Serbia and Europe now, so um, and looking towards Australia soon um, to get some engineers over there, so that we have a Microtech engineer up when the sun is up. And we basically do consulting, manage networks, monitoring, load testing. We've got our own data center in Denver. We do some customized hosting for uh, some of our clients. So if you need help with Microtech or a networking project, uh, feel free to give us a call. And as I mentioned, and new as of 2018, we opened an office in Nice, Serbia, uh, so that we can help support uh, UK and pretty much everything in the plus uh, GMT all the way to like plus three time zone. So we cover Africa with that as well. So I always uh, give Giannis Migas a hard time when I put this slide up, because if you've been through the Microtech Trainers course, he makes you put this slide in, um, or you're pretty much fail this course. Um, but this is the, the goal of the presentation. What are we going to talk about? What do I hope that you get out of this? Um, and for this presentation, I want to talk to you about changing the design of your border routers and thinking more like a tier one. You know, one of the things that small ISPs have a challenge with, um, and even enterprises, large enterprises have this challenge if they're going to put data centers on different continents and geographically diverse is, how do you manage your border routers? You know, once you get one border router and two border router and that turns into 10 border routers or even more, how do you deal with that scale and that challenge of the performance, um, the scale and the design? You know, what, what, is, uh, you know, what is an approach that you use to tackle that? And so that's what we're going to be talking about with BGP route reflectors for full tables, is how you can leverage that to improve the, the convergence in your own network. Um, we're going to look at using some open source software along with Microtik um, that you may or may not have heard of that we're going to use in conjunction with Microtik to help improve the performance of the CHR because it's, um, it's a piece of software that was kind of written for this task specifically, so it does very well. Um, and then also talk about the design benefits of when you put this into the design, what's the, you know, what's the advantage of this? What does it look like? So if you've seen any of the CHR work that I've done in some previous MUM presentations, you'll recognize the next two slides. But I kind of put them in here as a precursor to the testing and the performance that we're about to go through with the CCRs and the CHRs, which is really, if I'm going to use a BGP border router, what is the right choice? You know, do I want to use a CCR? Do I want to use an ARM-based uh, device? Or do I want to use uh, um, uh, a virtualized implementation? And so when you look at this, there is no one right answer. Um, I'd say these days I tend to lean towards the CHR pretty heavily because the performance is fantastic. 
But with the recent uh, release of the 4011, the 4011 is a great little border router. We actually use them as our border routers in our data center in Denver. Uh, and it works really well. The ARM uh, chip in there, which is the same as the, uh, the RB1100, has got a really high clock speed. And with the uh, addition of the 10 gig port, it actually makes for a pretty good little border router. So, um, you know, if you're not completely comfortable with the virtualized approach, you know, some people are very comfortable with hypervisors. Some people are not so comfortable with hypervisors. So if that's something that you're not quite ready to dive off into, the 4011 could be a good, uh, a good choice. So let's look at some of the differences of what, what makes them different before we get into the performance and, um, and why. So I think probably the most important thing to look at is what was the design intent of the CPU that goes into these things? You know, a lot of times you'll say, oh, well, CCR is kind of slow on this, or it doesn't do this as well. And you have to kind of look at the design intent of, you know, what it was made for. If you look at x86, which is what we run C uh, CHR on, it's, it's designed for heavy computational work at the expense and trade-off of a higher power draw. So if you're in a place where power doesn't really matter, or power is cheap, or it's not as big of an issue, then virtualization can be a great choice for you. Um, conversely, if you look at Telera, Telera was designed originally to be high-speed packet transfer um, at super low uh, power draw. So that was the original design of the chipset. And so it does very, very well at moving packets at high speed. Um, it's obviously not going to be quite as good at, um, at heavy computational loads as x86 because that's not what it was designed for. Um, but even under a small load, the Telera still does pretty well at BGP. And then you've got the ARM, which kind of falls in between the two, uh, in between x86 and, uh, and, the, um, and the Telera architecture as far as its performance. Um, you can't scale the ARM quite as much as you can with the x86, but it is definitely a better performer than the, uh, the Telera for this specific task. Um, and then you want to look at the throughput. Um, generally, the, the challenge with throughput on x86 is just you just got to put a lot of cores at it to move traffic. There's no big mystery to it. You just need to keep throwing uh, resources at it if you want to move a lot of data in x86 and get yourself the right board. Um, what you'll find on the, uh, um, the Telera architecture is that it handles uh, throughput of different frame sizes a little better than x86. And that's always traditionally been true of hardware-based routers and, and devices that when you're dealing with lower frame sizes, if you've got 64-byte frames, um, you're usually going to deal with that a little bit better on a hardware box than on a virtual machine. Um, and, the, uh, and the ARM is about the same way on the different frame sizes as, as we've tested it. And then you look at the performance for the full tables. I think unquestionably, um, when we did some work uh, in uh, the, it was the Berlin MUM, which was in 2018, we did a lot of testing in the CHR, and I think unquestionably the CHR performs uh, better on BGP border than the other two devices. But it's not always practical to put virtualization in, which is why we, we show the hardware alternatives, because if you're in South Africa, for example, South Africa is going through a massive energy crisis right now. They have major, major grid issues. So you may not have enough power available to run a virtualization solution, but you could put a 4011 on there because of the low power draw. So you know, as with most things in networking, it depends. So I'm going to talk a little bit about an open source piece of software that we used as part of this project as we were building the border router, um, Free Range Routing, which actually shares a common origin with Microtik because it is a fork of Quagga. And although Microtik doesn't really use Quagga in its routing code now, once upon a time, Microtik did actually have Quagga as part of the base of the routing code. So both of these have kind of common origins. But um, one of the things that this is used for a lot in the ISP world is if you're running an IX or if you're running a really large AS and you need a route reflector or a route server, um, you can take and compile this open source software to use as a routing daemon, and, uh, and it's multi-threaded, so you can actually take a lot of full tables into this software, and it will handle it very well. So it's a great companion to a Microtik CHR or a CCR if you're trying to improve the performance of your border router. Um, and free range routing does BGP, ISIS, LDP, OSPF, PIM, uh, and RIP, and uh, a few other things. Um, so it's basically a, an open source routing stack, uh, and it works really well. It's something that um, Quagga had not had a lot of development uh, in the last few years, um, and then it was resurrected. Um, I think it was Cumulus Linux that really kind of spearheaded the project and got this open source project going again. And so there's a lot of development now in open source routing. Um, and it's a very good fit with, uh, with Microtik if you're building a network um, to have a piece like that to slot in. <coughs> So one of the reasons we chose it um, is basically because it's multi-threaded for BGP. So if you want to scale your, your border routers, your CHRs, to a really high volume, you can take this and put it out of path. Um, it's just going to run on x86, whether it's virtualized or bare metal. You can take uh, free range routing and put it in a VM and then peer it as a route reflector to all of your Microtik border routers um, acting purely as a route reflector. Um, it's free because it's open source, so that's great. You can either download it through uh, Cumulus VX or go to their page and compile it yourself. Uh, on a couple different flavors of Linux. Uh, and like I mentioned before, it's, it's seen a lot of use uh, in the last, um, uh, well, going back to Quagga, but even after it's been forked, I'd say there's a good 10 years of, uh, of history or more 
as a route server, as a, as a route reflector. So uh, it's got a good track record. So looking at free range routing for the BGP route reflector. Um, you don't really need throughput for this um, because that's not the goal of this. This is what we call an out of path route reflector. No traffic is ever going to go through it. It literally acts as a way to aggregate all the tables from your CHRs or your CCRs, uh, um, store them and send them quickly back and forth between the routers um, so that you can uh, achieve better convergence speed. Um, if you want better, you know, better throughput at lower power draw, obviously that's where the MicroTik CCR or CHR comes in as a BGP border router. Um, and just you know, leverage the strength of open source software um, to give yourself scaling options. And that's, that's why we kind of chose free range routing and MicroTik paired together to test this. So I've got a couple different network designs and slides that I'm going to show you of things that we did and things that we tested. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I've got a blog called subarea51.net that we do a lot of like network engineering uh, work in. And there is a VM that we built uh, that was based on somebody else's work. We kind of wrapped up a VM to do a full table. So if you want to do a full BGP table in your lab, there's a VM that we've got you can download uh, to do this. And this is how we do it in our lab. And you can go out to RIPE, which maintains a database of all the BGP global table captured about every 30 minutes from you know, about 16 different places in the world. And so you can take those full tables, put them in this VM, and then feed it into your lab routers if you want to test re real world conditions of a full table as it comes into your router. So we've got a pretty extensive lab at our office in Jackson, Mississippi that we do a lot of our dev work in. So we had a combination of uh, um, CCR routers, CHR routers, uh, we had like an HP server running uh, um, ESXi, and then we also had a Baltic Vengeance router running uh, Hyper-V that participated in some of the testing. So if we take a look at all this here, Essentially what we've done is the virtual machine that we run the full table in represents these clouds here. Uh, so we took Lynx over in London, DKIX over in Germany, uh, AMS IX, mainly because these are the three highest volume IXs in the planet. They had the most routes available because they're, they're some of the largest IXs in the, on the planet and the RIPE has them in their database. So it was easy to capture. Because this kind of loads a little bit slowly, the way the Linux package is built, then we put another router in between it. So we used a CHR to take the routes in from the Linux server. And then that router kind of acts as the upstream router uh, to peer into our test network, which is over here on the left side uh, in the BGPAS over there. One thing you'll notice that uh, we kind of discovered when we first started testing this, these are the actual autonomous systems of these different IXs. You'll notice we don't use the exact autonomous system uh, when we do the peering. And the reason for that is when you're simulating the routes, um, if it actually sees uh, the AS in path when you're simulating the full table, it will start stripping a bunch of routes out of it. So if you want to get a high route table load, you have to kind of trick it and use a different AS um, so that it'll pass those through. So if anybody's wondering why these ASs are different than this, because somebody asked last time, that's the reason. And then we feed them into our test network. So everything here on the left side, this is actually the test network that we're going to do the uh, route reflector over there, which is our uh, VM for free range routing. We've got a CCR 1036, another 1036, and a 1072, mainly because that's what I had online in the lab at the time. And we did this to, uh, to test this. So here's the physical network you can see. Um, there's the HP server, which is running the CHRs that take the full feeds in. We've got uh, our core switch is a CRS 317. Uh, we've got a Baltic Networks uh, Vengeance over here running Hyper-V with a CHR in it for some later testing. And then there's our physical border routers that we had in the lab rack that we used to test all this on. So let's talk about the concept of testing and what we wanted to achieve. The main thing that I wanted to do was kind of look at, um, you know, as you get out of two tables, if you're, if you're a WISP or you're a small ISP, it's very, very common to have one upstream, maybe two upstreams. Once you start to get out of that, you start to notice performance challenges and things get a little more difficult for you. As you go into three feeds, four feeds, five feeds, things like that, you start to have a little bit more of a struggle with how you deal with this. So we wanted to start at three full tables on CCRs and hardware so we could look at what that would look like using the route reflector versus just full mesh peerings, um, which I'll explain in just a second. Then we added a CHR, just because I didn't have another CCR, into the mix to do four full tables uh, with the route reflector. And then we did the same test, only with full mesh peerings. Then we came down and did the CHR, and this is where we use the uh, Baltic Vengeance box, is uh, we had the CHR on Hyper-V as the ISP border router. We had three of those running on the box, doing the route reflector and then the full mesh peerings. So I'm going to take, before I get into the results here, um, I want to take just a second to kind of describe what the difference is between full table uh, route reflector and full mesh. In fact, I probably better back up to the diagram here just for a second. So what that means, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with BGP, 
is that when you take these routing tables into your border routers, you need a way to exchange the routes that are learned in on this path between all three of these routers. And that's traditionally done by peering the routers all to each other in addition to your upstreams. That's what we call a full mesh peering because every border router peers with each other. The challenge you have with that is um, that there's some networks that you know, we've been involved with that have 90 border routers or a few hundred border routers that are scattered across the planet. And when you're dealing with that scale of border routers, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to do a full mesh peering, not only because you need layer two transport or some kind of a layer two overlay to put them into a common segment to peer together, and that can be a challenge. Uh, and then you also need um, <clears throat> to have 200 peerings or 100 peerings between all the border routers, and that doesn't scale very well. So, and it's also pretty taxing on the control plane of the router to be managing that many peerings for this task. So that's where the BGP route reflector comes in. If you study IBGP, one of the things you learn is that route reflectors were designed to solve the full mesh problem. If you peer all your routers into a route reflector, every router does not have to peer with every other router. Now that's mo most commonly used, what you'll see in the small ISP world and the WISP world on the interior of the network. It's less common to see a route reflector that's dedicated to uh, just the global table, just your full tables. But as you get into larger networks, that's exactly what they do to scale. Oftentimes it'll be a cluster of route reflectors. You may see a cluster of four, eight, or maybe even up to 12 route reflectors all in like, you know, either global or continental uh, cluster to service an autonomous system. Um, but if you're doing it on a, on a smaller ISP, you can either do, uh, do one or a couple or, or build them on uh, um, redundant virtualization and have a single, uh, single router to handle that. Now, um, so that's the difference between the full mesh and the, and the route reflector as I, as I get into this to kind of explain that just a little bit. So let's take a look at the first test and see what we've got. First thing we did was take the two 1036s and the 1072. We peered them into the route reflector, which this is the output from the route reflector. If you've ever used a Cisco router, it looks very much like Cisco because Quagga has a CLI that is, uh, is very much like Cisco. And so we pumped 1.7 million routes into, into it. Uh, the IP transit convergence, which is meaning all of the upstreams finish their table load to the border routers in a certain amount of time. So at two minutes and 55 seconds, that's when the uh, upstreams finish their load into the border routers. Then the full convergence means once those have been learned, all the routers have to, have to talk to each other to figure out what is the best route. They look at all the different things in the BGP best path algorithm. You know, it's gonna look at the autonomous system, path length and weight and local pref and all those things. And that takes a lot of computational time, which is one of the other reasons that having a route reflector makes a lot of sense because it can offload some of that computational complexity of determining the BGP best path of all those full tables that come in. Because you could even put this on bare metal if you wanted to. Um, the guy that is actually the lead developer for this uh, is somebody I talked to, his name's Don Sharp. He's on uh, Slack a lot, we talk about. And he actually mentioned when I was doing this presentation that uh, the performance on bare metal is even way faster than what I have here. I mean, what I have here is just the limits of my lab, but if you wanted to get this better, you could probably get that time down to you know very, very minimal amount with really high-end hardware. But looking at this, we went on hardware uh, from two minutes and 55 seconds for all the upstreams to a full convergence at eight minutes and 51 seconds, which is, it's not great, it's okay. You definitely wanna be a little faster than that. And the way we measure that is um, something that you don't see in MicroTik Router OS, but you'll actually see in uh, Cisco and, and the uh, um, other Cisco-like operating systems, is the out queue messages um, as it's waiting to send BGP routes to a neighbor. It will show you how many routes are in queue that have not been accepted by the router. So basically, once this queue goes to zero, we know that we've achieved full convergence in all the routers. So one of the things that we did at the testing was keep refreshing this message until all of our out queues went to zero. And as you can see, we hit right at about eight minutes and 51 seconds across three CCRs with the route reflector. So we learned something interesting when we did this testing, uh, and that was the one thing that actually improved for the hardware routers, the full convergence time really didn't change a whole lot because there was um, the, the single process uh, in BGP was kind of a limiting factor uh, there for the overall convergence time. But the one thing that did get measurably better was the, the load time from your upstreams. We shaved that off uh, a good bit, almost less than half when using the route reflector because the router's only having to manage two peerings now instead of three, or as you keep adding, you know, if you were to add five upstreams to this, the router would be managing six total peerings, one to its upstream and then five to all of its border routers, whereas in the route reflector approach, it peers with its upstream, then it peers with the route reflector. So the router's having to deal with fewer, uh, fewer peerings, which is a little less taxing on it. So we got a little better on the hardware. So it was, it was definitely enough that you would want to adopt this to get yourself a little bit more performance, but you're not going to get great on the, on the CCRs because of the, the limiting factor there. 
So now let's add four peers and see what we did. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have another CCR. I really wanted to use another CCR, but I didn't have one in the lab, so I kind of cheated and used the CHR here to see what does it look like when we get four tables in, and what does that convergence time look like? So I think for the, we've used Lynx, DKIX, and AMS IX for this, and then uh, New York Internet Exchange is the one we added um, for the fourth uh, upstream. So that's what we've got dumping into our routing table for the fourth router that we added. So if you look at this, the IP transit convergence, obviously, now that we have four tables, goes up a little bit. We're at five minutes and 33 seconds for the IP transit convergence. Now we're up to from 1.7 million routes into 2.2 million routes. So we've got a fair number of routes going into the router. And it took about 16 minutes and 51 seconds for her full convergence. So getting you know, a little bit long on achieving full convergence on, on all the routing. When you start to get into here, you're you know, going to start wanting to look at CHRs and things like that because the CHR, um, as we'll see in a minute, um, converges just a little bit faster than this. So here's the full mesh side, which again is similar results to what we saw last time. We got better on the IP transit convergence. It was two minutes longer if you're doing full mesh peerings on taking your tables in. And they were roughly about the same time, maybe a few seconds later on the full convergence. So not a huge difference in the time there. So now let's skip to the CHRs. Um, and if any of you have watched any of the presentations that I, I've done, um, uh, I did one in uh, um, Berlin in 2018, and then I did another one just recently among Europe in uh, Vienna that was really focused on the CHR and the performance benefits. Um, and I, I, I tend to feel that right now that CHR is probably one of your best options as a border router, not only because it's very low cost, but because you can just ramp up resources as much as you want to uh, to solve whatever the problem is that you need in your border. Uh, so what we did here was took three CHRs on Hyper-V, uh, notably it's Hyper-V because Microtik performs better on Hyper-V than any other hypervisor, hands down. Um, uh, I, we've used DSXI, we've used Proxmox, we did benchmark testing, we've also done production testing, and Hyper-V is unquestionably the best hypervisor for CHR by a mile. So if you're not looking at Hyper-V for your CHR, uh, I definitely would be looking at it as a hypervisor. I know a lot of people groan about that, people that live in the Linux space, people that are not Microsoft fans are like, oh, really, you know, Microsoft Hyper-V? But um, I think what, you know, what happened, I talked to Microtix developers about this in a previous conference, and I think they had off-the-shelf drivers for uh, ESXi and KVM that they were putting in when they first built the CHR. And as I was talking to their developers in Germany, you know, they had to kind of really build a lot of the Hyper-V stuff more from scratch. So I think the performance of it got a little bit better as a result because a lot more time was invested into the drivers for Hyper-V um, on the network side as well as the hypervisor layer and the way it interacts. And I think that's why we see uh, so much better performance on Hyper-V. Um, and that's a theory, but the Microtik developers kind of agreed with that and, and felt that that lined up with, with their development. So let's take a look at the performance. And you're gonna see a massive difference. Um, actually, I have six here because we, we added three more peers. There's only three of these that are actually active. So now you're gonna see a huge jump in performance. We've taken in full tables uh, from all of our upstreams at 17 seconds for three tables. All full of them are fully loaded. And then you look at our full convergence, and we have full convergence of 41 seconds, which is right there with the, with the highest end ASR and Juniper at maxes. When you're taking in tables at that speed um, to be completely converged across all three, that's, that's really fast. And then let's look at the CHR in full mesh peering. So, um, and a note on this, I did see some, I had to take an average because the, the full mesh had some really widely varying results. So I did, I ran it about 10 times and kind of took an average of it. So what you're seeing really represents more of an average of the testing that I did um, than any one single test because the, the full mesh peering was a little more all over the map, whereas the route reflector was more consistent. But same number of routes, 2.2 million. Transit convergence was a little higher, it was about double, it was 35 seconds to pull in the full feeds. And then full convergence was about two minutes on average from what we saw. So it's not bad and it's still really good performance, but compared to the route reflector, you're still gonna get better performance on the route reflector because again, it's offloading all that complexity of the BGP best path um, onto the RR. So let's talk a little bit about the performance conclusions of this testing before I get into, I've got a couple designs, uh, uh, a couple slides about the design, uh, and then we'll wrap up and open it up for questions. Um, but I think definitely BGP route reflector can help improve the performance. Um, the CCR, it's, you know, it's maybe, maybe 20 to 30%, but you're still gonna get a faster load time on your, uh, on your initial IP transit load. And, and most importantly, you're gonna get scale options, which to me is, is, is as important, if not more, than the performance considerations because you have a way to scale, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, it doesn't significantly over, uh, overall impact the uh, convergence time when talking about the CCRs. Um, it does impact the overall convergence time in the CHRs, for sure. 
Um, and then as the number of IX and transit peers increases, this approach becomes more and more valuable because dealing with that full mesh again as you increase border routers and peerings um, is, is very, very important and having a way to, to handle that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's probably very evident in the talk, but CHR plus a BGP route reflector gives you kind of the best of all worlds. You've got uh, the best product from Microtik for this specific task, uh, you know, with incredibly uh, high performance on Hyper-V. And then you marry it with a BGP route reflector that's uh, got multiple threads. And, you know, you've got a way to really scale up some performance at, you know, a fraction of the cost if you were to go with a Juniper or a Cisco solution. So I've got a couple slides on the design advantages of the BGP RR. We've talked about the um, we talked about the performance benefits, but let's talk about some of the design benefits. Um, probably one of the most uh, common challenges people come to us in consulting when they're dealing with BGP and they want to understand how to solve this problem is, uh, as you grow as an ISP, um, you may have a customer that approaches you that has their own autonomous system and wants to advertise their space with you. Um, you know, maybe an enterprise, maybe another smaller ISP, but a lot of our customers have, have come across this issue. And the question is always, well, how do I do that? Do I peer them into my border routers? Or, you know, how do I handle that? And, and the answer is yes, you can peer them into your border routers. But one of the things that you find is that it becomes a... a it becomes a big challenge because you're putting the customers directly into a critical part of your network, and you've got a customer router that's directly attached to a critical portion of your network, and you also don't really have any easy way to scale. If you go add another upstream, well, then you've got to remember to run a link from that border router back to that customer router or the router you have serving it, and so it becomes a bit of a challenge. This is where a BGP route reflector can be a huge help, and this is how most of the larger ISPs do it is instead of getting them directly into your network, you may have a customer in their autonomous system down here. They may have another upstream they're peered with, and then you've got their aggregation, whether that's fiber or RF or whatever that is. You can put out a PE router that's designed for full tables, peer it back into the route reflector, take all the routes that are in your autonomous system into the table of this router that's going to be facing this customer. And if you're an MPLS shop, this gets really easy because you can use MPLS to transit wherever this physically is. This could be very deep in your network, and you can use MPLS, VPLS to go all the way back to where that route reflector is and put this out facing your customer. Or you can do the reverse. You can put this in your data center or your POP, and you can use VPLS to bring that slash 30 from your customer all the way back to your data center. So you can do this two ways around if you're in an MPLS network. But the major advantage is you've got a layer of insulation and scalability in your network as you serve that customer because now they're not getting directly into your border routers. If this router goes nuts, it only affects this router right here, and then you can just shut down the offending peer if it happens to impact your route reflector or put route dampening or something like that on to, to automatically control it. Whereas if they're peered directly in, you've got some issues there. Um, so that's one uh, really huge benefit of that approach in using the route reflector is the scale options for serving customers. The other thing that makes it really easy is if you use BGP communities to tag all of your routes as they're coming in from your upstreams, and if you don't, I would highly recommend that you look at it because you'll be able to do uh, a lot more elegant filtering of your autonomous system if you assign BGP communities to all of the upstream feeds that you learn. You may have a customer that says, you know, um, I'm already peered with links, and I've already got a, a, a peering into links, so I really don't want to have links routes sent to me because I've already got a peering with them. So as you're uh, configuring this router here that's going to peer with the customer, you can write a policy that says, I want to filter out this community, and I want to kick links out of the mix of these routes that I serve to the customer, and I want to use just dkicks and AMSIX. And that could be level three or cogent or whoever you've got in your mix. But the point is, you can easily filter routes out to kind of match either what the customer wants, or more importantly, if you have cheaper IP transit that you would rather put the customer on that's better for you, you can filter out more expensive options as you serve those routes to the customer and really just customize the way in which you want to do that. And if you have it built into a route reflector with a community architecture, that gives you a number of options to do that, whereas if you're not built in that design, it becomes a lot harder and you've got to kind of really roll out the duct tape and a custom solution to, uh, to do that. So, uh, and that pretty much wraps it up uh, for this presentation. I'm going to open the floor up for questions if anybody's got questions about uh, this particular topic. Questions? Yes, sir. I actually did not try soft reconfiguration on there. Um, but if we'd put the, um, I had it running on a hypervisor, which was a little bit older hypervisor. Um, and in talking to the developers, if you put it on bare metal, um, they've, uh, they've gotten up to several hundred tables with pretty much all the bells and whistles on and been able to do it in like a minute or two. So I think probably if you were to put soft reconfiguration on on bare metal with a really good processor, I don't think you'd see much of a dent.
Obviously, if the route reflector goes down, then you do have a massive impact. So what I would recommend that you consider doing is you can either run a couple of route reflectors and peer up to a couple route reflectors. That's one way to do it. Um, if you're really after performance, like if you're really concerned about having more, like multiple peerings uh, out and that's a performance consideration for you, you could always look at putting hypervisors geographically distributed to where that route reflector instance could fail over to another data center if you needed it to, and that wouldn't be too hard to set up. So that way, you know, you could kind of have the best of both worlds of the redundancy and having, you know, minimal peerings. All right, any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.